You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, We'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin from the conference board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss the state of the global economy. First, we'll look at the newly released data on consumer confidence, and then we'll dig into the economic outlook for the US, Europe, China, and the rest of the globe. Joining me today is our chief economist at the conference board, Dana Peterson. Dana, welcome. Hi, Steve. How are you? Great. And Dana, we just, the conference board just released its U.S. Consumer Confidence Survey. What happened in January? Sure. The index actually dipped in January after an upwardly revised uh, uptick in the previous month in December. Um, We did see uh, a little bit improvement, a little bit of improvement in the present situation, but the expectations gauge dipped back down below 80. So the present situation is how people are feeling like right now, which was a little bit better. But yes, but six months out, they're saying, oh, we're still worried, right? They are. And that's what's being uh, shown in the expectations gauge. Exactly. Okay. so what does that mean about how they're feeling and how they might be acting here is coming into 23? Sure. So, I mean, these are some of the early data points that we've that we've gotten in 2023, and we certainly know that towards the end of the year, consumers slowed their spending, not only for goods, but also for services. Um, consumers are still using credit cards to purchase things, and they still are working, but we are seeing some evidence of a slowdown here. And so we may see, um, even though the, the present situation was healthy, uh, consumers are still worried about what's going to happen in the future, potentially about jobs or their financial situations. Well, they had all that stimulus money and, and there were, the savings rate had gone up and they had that cash that they were working off. But that's kind of run its way through now, right? If people are depending more on credit cards. Absolutely. Um, you know, most of the, that extra money from the fiscal stimulus was already spent, especially by lower income persons. And the higher income persons are less likely to spend that. They're more likely to invest it and it becomes wealth and people don't tend to tap into wealth, you know, at the upper end of the income spectrum. Indeed, when we look at the consumer confidence gauge in terms of who was less optimistic, um, it was certainly folks with uh, at the lower end of the income spectrum and also people under 35. So younger people and persons with um, not as much income are definitely being impacted by what's going on in their in the economy right now. Yeah, and this that's pretty typical, isn't it? That uh, you know the the people who have money, you know, the more wealthy people are less impacted by inflation in basic goods like food and gas, which is you know which is really what's been what's been going up. But you know, if you're on the lower end, in, you know, you're running paycheck to paycheck. You know, those 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 changes in gas prices and food prices really wallop you. Yeah, so it's not only gas and food, and indeed, gas prices ticked up again in January and food prices have been elevated and they continue to rise, but rents are also quite elevated and rents are up as a reflection of what happened in the past in the housing market. Certainly during the pandemic, there was very strong demand for housing with interest rates at at rock bottom prices. And so we saw home price valuations for new homes and and existing homes shoot up. Um, While that's unwinding with the Fed raising interest rates, it takes a while for it to show up in rents because rents don't all get repriced at the same time. So the lag can be anywhere from one year to 18 months between the peak in home price valuations and it's showing up in lower rents. So you're right, consumers are being hit where in their pockets where on necessary unnecessary items such as what they're going to eat and where they're going to live. Yeah, you mentioned the, uh, and how they're going to drive, and how they're going to yeah, and how they're going to pay for all of that. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, uh, the younger folks were a little worried, and I know we have to be careful about month to month fluctuations. But I was really, it was really interesting to see that, and I, you know, you can't help but pick up a paper these days and and read about all the layoffs that are happening in tech, and I, you know, I in how this is rattling, you know, people who are more junior in your career, and I. 
that just it just seems to me that you know if, if I was a younger person I might be a little more worried because of just everything that's coming at them uh, you know all at once. Well, I think it's also student loans, right? So student loans have been at least the payments have been on on hold throughout the pandemic, and that might go away in a few months. And so that's that certainly is uh, in the future going to weigh on you know, household incomes of, of younger people. But certainly that worry. Um, in addition to the fact that it's so much more expensive to eat and to rent out a place and to drive, um, I think is also a factor affecting younger people. Why do you think, so the present situation and now uh, uh, index was a little better, the expectations a little worse. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, what, what, why do people feel pretty good about right now, but, and, and why are they worried about six months from now? I think right now, um, Many people, most people are still working. The unemployment rate's at three and a half percent. That is extremely low. That's a very tight labor market. And it's still the case, um, even though we hear about layoffs in tech and retail and finance, those are the industries that really outperformed during the pandemic when people were very much focused on buying goods and playing around the stock market and interest rates were low. Now interest rates are higher, so that negatively affects the financial sector. And you know, people have moved away from goods, so they're not interested in, in going in buying retail. And certainly um, most a lot of people are heading back to work, so they don't need all the tech. But outside of that, we're still seeing a lot of strength in the labor market, especially in those in-person services. And almost everyone across the board, especially people who switch jobs, are experiencing higher wages. So with a, a strong labor market backdrop, you know, abstracting away from those few industries that are struggling right now, and increases in wages and some slight declines in, in, in inflation that we've seen in recent months, maybe that's giving people a little bit of hope about what's happening right now. But in the future, they're still hearing on the news that there could be a recession in the United States. And so some people may be getting worried about their jobs. Certainly when there are recessions, they're concerned that it might be them who gets axed, um, even though we're saying that uh, there are probably still a number of industries that will continue to hire, uh, even if we have a recession. Yeah, and I, I may be abusing the data here, which, you know, because I'm, an, I'm not an economist, I'm, uh, I'm want to do, but <laughs> does this does this change in expectations index? In other words, people thinking, you know, the, their expectations for the next six months is lower. Does that portend a recession? Well, historically, whenever that index, uh, the expectations index is below the threshold of 80, it often signals a recession. Either the recession is, is happening right now or it's going to happen in the next six to 12 months. And it's done a very good job of signaling that. And indeed, that measure um, has been below 80 for many more months than it's been above over the last year. So it's been signaling for a while that consumers expect some kind of an economic downturn and it's still signaling that even today. Yeah. Just looking at buying plans, because this is um, you know part of what we've surveyed with the, with the Consumer Confidence Survey each month. Consumers are are telling us, you know, that I know we we survey about uh, you know big ticket goods and autos and houses and all that. W what did you read this time? Well, I mean, these these data are a little uh, lumpy, um, but in general, um, for the month, people were a little bit optimistic about um, purchasing big ticket items like cars and appliances. They weren't interested in buying homes, but in general, we know from uh, not only the our confidence data, but from looking at consumer spending data that people are buying fewer big ticket items and they're purchasing more services. But the big question is how long are they going to continue to purchase those services? Yeah, and, and if interest rates continue to rise, they're not going to be able to afford that because you know if if, if you're putting, you know, taking out a car loan, it you may not be able to make monthly payments on a new car. So you know, you got to take that into account as well. And, and that sort of raises the question about, you know, what, what are consumers telling us about their inflation expectations? Well, inflation expectations typically follow what's going on with gasoline prices. And they did tick up a little bit in the month uh, as gasoline prices rose. But in general, inflation expectations are, are quite elevated 
relative to where they were in 2019. And that's something the Federal Reserve is watching very closely. They do not want elevated inflation expectations to become embedded, meaning people think that in the future prices are always going to be significantly higher. And so that's a big reason for why they're raising interest rates, not only to lower the actual level of inflation, but also to keep inflation expectations anchored, meaning bringing them down and keeping them low. Yeah, it's an interesting point because you you know you hear some economists saying now that you know ah you know two percent probably you know why do we need that as a target maybe it should be three percent or higher but that's not what the Fed is saying and 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 uh, and that's that's certainly not their actions um, according to your projections right no um, the Fed has a target it's two percent and history has shown that 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 level makes sense for making sure that you continue to have economic growth without inflation overtaking expectations and people not spending because they're thinking that, you know, that prices are always going to be higher. Um, And certainly the Fed is still committed and there's a meeting actually tomorrow. (laughs) So, but there, there's a February meeting and at least up until that meeting, they have been signaling that they are committed to lowering inflation to 2%. However, with each uh, subsequent publication of their estimates, it it keeps getting pushed out when we're actually gonna get to 2% inflation. And that's because you have these sticky elements like food prices and the rents, Um, but they are still committed to 2%. So what's the conference sports current estimate of uh, the next couple of months? There's there's two, two months worth of uh, Fed meetings. What what are we estimating that the Fed will do tomorrow and then also in March? Sure, we think the Fed is going to raise interest rates by 25 basis points at their February meeting, and then again by 25 basis points at the March meeting, and then they'll call it a day. However, their, their estimates of where the Fed funds rate should be suggest that there could be a third hike this year. But our thoughts are, you know, two, three more hikes, and then they're going to stay pat. They're going to pause and leave interest rates where they are for the balance of this year and not consider any interest rate cuts until early 2024. And, and also then, what are, what is your, um, your your current inflation projection for 2023 and 2024? Sure. So for the end of this year, we think that overall inflation and also inflation less food and energy is going to slow to 2.8% year on year. So that's still, that's closer to 3%, not 2%. And we probably won't uh, achieve 2% until sometime close to the end of 2024. And, and hence your forecast that there's going to be, you know, two or three more Fed moves here to try to to try to engineer a, a soft landing, which which is, you know, admirable goal, but but very difficult to do. Um, any other uh, results from the consumer confidence survey that you'd like to point out? I think, you know, what it's telling us is that in general, it, it's been moving back and forth in a pretty narrow range for several months now. It's definitely better than the low that we saw last year in the springtime, but still in all, consumers are are still waffling in terms of what they're feeling, especially with the present situation, but the expectations have been almost persistently negative. And so consumers are still waiting for another shoe to drop. And it may take until the springtime before we see consumers relaxing a bit, especially if we don't actually have a recession, but we still do have recession as our forecast, a short and shallow one, but a recession nonetheless. All right. We're talking with Dana Peterson, the chief economist at the conference board about the consumer confidence index. Next, after the break, we're going to talk about her global forecasts. Take a short break and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the volatile and uncertain economy, The award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board predicts a downturn by the end of 2022. Recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the Conference Board has always done, We are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges. 
to find out how you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side, visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession, located at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO's Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by the Chief Economist at the Conference Board, Dana Peterson. So Dana, we talked a lot about what's going to happen in the U.S. before the break. Let's turn to the global economy. Share with us what your outlook and forecasts are for the global economy for the next year or two. Sure. We still expect that the global economy is going to slow in 2023 relative to 2022. So the global economy grew by about three and a quarter percent last year, and it's probably going to grow by about two and a quarter percent this year. So what's happening underneath that growth rate? Well, we think that the U.S. and Europe are going to slow and that they're going to both experience a brief period of recession, not too bad, but recessions nonetheless. And so with that, that's going to bring down that growth rate overall for the global economy. However, we do think that emerging markets are going to be key here in terms of supporting growth, even that 2.2%. Certainly China is going to be uh, a meaningful element of that. We expect that Chinese growth is gonna grow, the Chinese economy is going to expand by 5.1% this year compared to the roughly, you know, two and three quarters percent that we saw last year. And that's a function of, well, a few things. Uh, Certainly China rebounding from three years of very weak growth associated with pandemic restrictions. Indeed, that's one of the major reasons why China was very weak last year. And also China seeing some stabilization in its housing market. And so with those things, uh, we think that China will will improve. However, even with that, there are some downside risks, which we can talk about in a minute. But still in all, weaker growth this year for the global economy, um, with much of the growth that we will see being led by China, and then a bit of a pickup next year, but certainly growth rates that will not be as strong as what we saw prior to the pandemic. But there's still growth rates. So, you know, there are people who are saying, well, you know, we're worried about a global recession, but that that is not what we're forecasting. We're still forecasting, you know, two plus percent growth for the globe. So that that's that's not a global recession. Right. And we haven't forecasted uh, a global recession, even though we have been forecasting regional recessions, certainly in the U.S. and Europe. Yeah. And I and so far you've been right. <laughs> so people should listen to you, Dana. You, your your forecasts have been very accurate. It's uh, something we're very proud of. You you mentioned upsides and downsides to that, of course, you know, everything's variable. So, you know, talk through what, you know, what could be the upsides and downsides. Sure. So um, starting with the downsides, I think if the recessions that were the short and shallow recessions we're forecasting for the U.S. or Europe are worse than expected, right? So right now in the US, we're really on the cusp of this recession that we're that we're projecting. We're projecting it to start in the first quarter. And here we are, uh, end of January. So, and we have very little data. We'll get some more data this week um, to get a, uh, some insights on what's going to happen or what did happen at the start of the year. Um, but things could be much worse, certainly if inflation uh, continues to remain sticky or even makes a turnaround starts rising again because China's reopening and that forces global energy prices to rise and the Fed goes further, right? That could certainly uh, be a negative for the U.S. economy. Also, if uh, geopolitically, globally, if we have uh, even worse outcomes than we, than we already expect for Ukraine um, in terms of use of you know, uh, very, very dangerous weapons or even more embargoes on trade or, and those kinds of things. Um, certainly those are downside risks. Uh, and, and when we look at China in terms of China's rebound, there are four things that we're very focused on that could mean that the rebound is not as robust as we expect. And even 5.1% is much lower than what China's used to, uh, but certainly better than last year. And the four things are, how much will private consumption recover? And we really need services consumption in China to come back. Will the real estate sector stabilize or will we have renewed issues in terms of weighing on the economy? And then the third thing is external demand. China is very much dependent upon demand with the U.S. and and 
and the and Europe. And so if the US and Europe do worse than expected, then that's a negative for China. And then finally, of course, you know, going back to those geopolitical issues, what's China's relationship with the US and are there any new, you know, conflagrations that weigh on growth in either of the of those economies? Um, so I think those are the downside risks. On the upside, uh, we could have quote unquote soft landings where you don't have recessions in the US or Europe. And certainly Europe may actually have a soft landing because the energy crisis that was in the making um, seems like it's it's not as bad. Um, and certainly Europe grew faster last year than we expected. And also they're having a pretty mild winter. So maybe uh, they won't experience a deep uh, a recession at all. And certainly in the US consumers, as we talked about, are still buying things, um, not as much as they were, but they're still willing to put items on their credit cards and they're still willing to go on vacations. And so there's certainly these upside and downside risks to our base case. Yeah, and a lot of this has been supply driven. You know, we came out of the, re the, uh, the pandemic and the supply chains were all messed up and there was a lack of supplies of coming out of China and there's their lockdowns constrained supplies that that's starting to normalize but then you still have the war which has put uh you know the squeeze on other supplies then you have crop failures you know we've got a potato shortage for example right now that has nothing to do with any of that it's just it right. just is and the avian uh, flu causing egg prices to flu. be elevated I mean, yeah. <laughs> You have all of these. <laughs> Never ends. You, you would call them gray swan events, but you know, it's just like how many of them can we can we pack in here? It's just been uh but you know, this is all at some point you would think that this will normalize. And I think that's your point, which is, you know, if it normalizes, then of course, you know, you could you could see the upside to this. But uh well, well wow, what, I guess, what a wild couple of years, huh? Yeah, and I and I guess. I wouldn't say that things normalize or it's just that things aren't as bad as we expect, right? I, I don't really know if there's a normal anymore. There's always some new thing, <laughs> serial crises. Um, and honestly, in terms of thinking about inflation, I think we are in a different um, period, a different regime when it comes to inflation. I think inflation is going to be higher going forward than it has been in the past. Growth is probably going to be slower, which we've been forecasting in our 10-year outlook. So. We're not going back to pre-pandemic uh, activities, um, but certainly I think we could have better outcomes than what we're expecting, and that's the upside. Yeah, well, I, I know you and I are normal, Dana, so we'll we'll be the definer, the defining factors here. You know, you you talk about the soft landing, and economists talk about uh, about the soft landing, and it's something that the Fed tries to engineer whenever you're coming off of these inflationary things. What does a soft landing mean? And, you know, um, you know, and what are the alternatives, I guess? What's a hard landing look like? Sure, so it's it's really fuzzy. Everyone is defining a soft landing in, in a different way. The way I think of a soft landing is the Fed is able to reduce inflation back to the 2% target or at least somewhere near it without inducing a recession and even you might have a mild recession, but not having a, a really long, deep recession. So some people say, well, no recession is a soft landing. Some people say a modest recession is a soft landing. Um, so it's it's there's really no hard and fast rule, unfortunately, and everyone's just kind of, you know, coming up with their own terminology for it. But I, I think the key thing is the Fed has said that they want to reduce inflation. It could be some pain. Um, and that pain could be defined by, you know, increases in the number of unemployed people, but very far from a deep recession that lasts, you know, for for many quarters or, or years. Yeah, and you've talked about it in terms of a Goldilocks uh, economy, meaning, you know, the Fed's trying to hit two percent or below in inflation and two percent or above in in growth, right? And and you know, that's 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 sort of nirvana, but it doesn't always happen that way. Well, no, and I, I think. I, I think in terms of you know two percent or greater in growth, I I would I would suggest that you know not having negative growth, right, it may be the the uh, desire here because um, the economy can grow very slowly, and that's okay. Um, in terms of a landing, when you have you know five hundred basis points of interest rate hikes, that's really you know that that's really the best of of, of every world there. Yeah, I but you know, and then you've got you know a bad situation, which is you know you're talking if you if you can only bring inflation down to three to four percent, but yet you have 
growth that's zero to one percent, you know, you've referred to that as stagflation. We haven't experienced that since, since the 70s. That would be a bad thing, right? Yes. And that's usually over an extended period of time, you know, because you can have any one quarter where you have high inflation and a negative GDP growth rate. It's where it becomes those two dynamics become persistent. So do you think the U.S. labor market is signaling a soft landing? Is, is that your interpretation? I think I think um, it, depending on how you define soft landing, I think what the labor market is telling us is that that there's still a lot of good fundamentals in the U.S. economy and that this recession that we're forecasting is being orchestrated in order to bring down inflation. It's not the case that there's something underlying the economy that's bad. And certainly when we think about the labor market. This time really is different from prior recessions and and what's different are labor shortages. We've never had it, and I talk about this every time we talk, but it's never been the case that we've had millions of people exiting the labor market at the same time. Um, meanwhile, you have very restrictive immigration policies and you have many people who were being on the sidelines, you know, especially parents and caregivers, um, because you have entire industries that haven't finished rehiring all the people that were let go during the pandemic. So you have all these firsts, um, but the biggest thing is the fact that you have this shrinking labor force. And with that, it means that businesses are probably going to be more reluctant to let people go wholesale unless they're under, you know, dire straits. And we know there are some industries that are, are very challenged right now, but for the most part, you're still going to see this hiring and you're going to see this retention of workers. Indeed, our own survey of CEOs, several surveys indicate that executives still want to hire. They're not, most are not focused on uh, letting people go. And so to that extent, you know, the labor market is telling us those stories. Yeah, and, and you've you described this as, you know, potentially a job full recession, meaning that, you know, we're at historic lows with three and a half percent unemployment, um, lots of job openings um, and skill set shortages in, in various industry shortages at the same time that we could be experiencing this mild recession. So this is really unusual and unlike anything we've seen in modern history. Indeed. Yeah. Um, just uh, we've, we've covered, I think, U.S. And, and China. Just last words on on Europe, uh, risks around, you know, their central bank uh, moves and inflation and so forth. Yes, I mean, Europe is really interesting because um, we thought that they were going to have this terrible recession because of the spike in, in inflation. And that spike in inflation was a direct consequence of the war in Ukraine. Um, Russia invaded Ukraine. Sanctions were imposed upon Russia. Russia responded by cutting off natural gas to Western Europe. And so the response to, by Western Europe was to implement um, restrictions on how much uh, natural gas could be used. Um, but it turns out that a combination of those restrictions on usage, plus a warm winter and the ability to find other sources for natural gas, especially from the US and MENA, have helped actually build up inventories of natural gas. And so, and they're, you know, again, they're having this warm winter. So the crisis is not as bad as it could have been. Um, but still in all, inflation is very elevated. We may have seen a peak. Um, it's not clear. We only have a couple of months worth of data um, in terms of inflation bending downward and slowing. And so at least for the ECB and the Bank of England, there, there may be a few more interest rate hikes. The ECB is not going to go as far as the Bank of England because the ECB has to worry about 27 economies, which are all in uh, in different states of, of growth and, and health, whereas the Bank of England only has to worry about one economy, and that's the UK. Well, one thing's for certain. There's so many unknowns and so many things happening with this economy that this is uh, what I would call the full employment for economists economy. We, we need economists more than ever before. And Dana Peterson is the chief economist of the conference board. Dana, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Always great to be here. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in economics, geopolitics, public policy, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues. Email them, text them, send it around, send it to your family. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you 
by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation for over 100 years. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side. Just visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, your indispensable guide through the global recession, located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.